So I want to thank you all for joining me today. Uh, my name is Dan Butterworth. I'm from First Financial Credit Union uh, in the Northern Chicagoland area. Uh, today, I uh, wanted to spend some time talking to you about PPP, not PPE, um, not personal protective equipment, uh, any of those things. I'm sure we're well familiar with that as of this point. Uh, the focus of today will be to discuss the Paycheck Protection Program, um, which is part of the uh, CARES Act and was rolled out in early 2020. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to say thank you to Stephanie for the opportunity and for the invitation um, to come speak to you all today. Uh, what I hope to do is just kind of help demystify the process. Uh, I understand that uh, the program was, you know, reactionary to the ongoing pandemic, and it was something that the Small Business Administration put together relatively quickly um, with the goal of just getting funds in the hands of small business owners um, and self-employed individuals. So uh, with that being said, you know, the program has evolved uh, we're now in what would be the third round of the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, so each time the program has re-upped, uh, the experience has gotten a little easier, the process uh, a little better. So what I hope to do is take you through that today. Uh, I do want to say that uh, I want this to be very conversational. So if you come across something, if there's a question you have, feel free to stop me and jump in. Uh, it's not something that we have to you know, try to jot down notes to the very end um, and then hope you remember them or, you know, run into something else. So please feel free to stop me if at any time you have questions, uh, feel free to jump in and I'll do my best to answer those. So we'll start with just a very high level introduction of what we wanna accomplish today. So I hope to take you through uh, a few questions about what the Paycheck Protection Program is, um, who is eligible to apply, how the application process works. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit about the application deadline, which is actually um, upcoming, which is why the timing is perfect for this. Um, and then leave you with some information on how you could apply should you choose to. So the Paycheck Protection Program is a forgivable loan program that's offered by the US Small Business Administration. Uh, the key word there uh, in bold being forgivable, uh, meaning that if you apply for the loan and are granted uh, loan funds, there's a process in place to make sure that if the loan funds are used uh, for the intended purpose, that you actually don't have to pay them back. The SBA would remit uh, funds to pay off the loan to any uh, lender that uh, offers the SBA loan um, and to uh, anybody who meets the guidelines of the program. Uh, the program was put in place uh, and is intended to be used as a payroll uh, slash owner's compensation replacement tool. Um, so the dollars that are lent out through this program have a very specific use um, that has to be followed, which is what kind of dictates the forgivability of the loan, if you will. Uh, so in addition to owner's compensation or payroll, uh, the loan can also cover select business expenses such as rent, utilities, PPE. I joked about it a little earlier, but PPP is covered. Um, and just at a very high level, the loans, all loans structured over the program or throughout the program um, all have the same guidelines. There's not like underwriting criteria. They're considered to be five-year closed-end loans at a 1% interest rate. Uh, the payments are also deferred on the loan for 10 months from the date of origination um, because there is that forgivable piece, which we'll talk about. So the Paycheck Protection Program or PPP loan amounts are uh, fixed and they're calculated based on a formula that's published by the SBA. Um, so the SBA has determined that the loan amount is based on two and a half months of payroll or owner's compensation. Uh, so when we say uh, owner's compensation, I'll get into a little bit, I know as you know, realtors and real estate agents, that uh, there are some specific differences in the way you all would do, you know, file, your file your taxes, um, versus say an LLC or a corporation or something like that. So the focus of my discussion will be to, to try to kind of tailor that um, to your specific needs and to your use, but we'll definitely answer questions on any other type of organizational structures if they do come up. Uh, one call out I uh, wanted to, a couple call outs here is there are limits in place um, for the self-employed owner's compensation. I'll, I'll share those in just a, a slide or two. Uh, but there have also been recent changes to the program um, that will allow self-employed individuals to use gross income versus everyone net. In our office. Um, so Someone's not on mute. That's all right. I was able to uh, mute them. So the, uh, this recent change, uh, I believe, would be great, especially for self-employed uh, self individuals like you all, uh, because you can use gross income versus net. So obviously, 
um, in, in your line of business, there's a lot of expenses that go towards marketing. There's a lot of uh, you know, costs incurred traveling and a lot of deductible expenses that ultimately drive down that net income uh, number at the end of the year in an effort to kind of minimize your you know, tax liability. So uh, makes sense. But up until about two weeks ago, the only number that uh, the SBA was using as part of this formula was that net income number. Um, so we're now using a gross income figure, which uh, generally will lead to a higher loan amount uh, based on a higher owner's compensation calculation. A uh, quick note about forgiveness. I've mentioned a few times that you know, really the, the whole point of the loan is not only just to apply for it and get the funds quickly to replace compensation, um, but if those funds are used for the purposes intended, uh, which is at least 60% of your loan proceeds being used on payroll or owner's compensation, those, lo those loans are generally forgivable, uh, meaning that you owe nothing on them. Uh, I mentioned that there's a, you know, two pieces to this process. You apply for the loan, and then at a later date, you apply for forgiveness. Uh, once forgiveness is granted, we would actually receive funds from the SBA to pay off that loan, kind of wipe your hands clean, and there's no obligation on your part. Another important uh, facet of the loan program is there's no uh, collateral, there's no personal guarantee or any type of uh, credit qualifications as part of the loan. Um, it does not, you know, go through FCRA. Uh, the only regulation it's subject to is the U.S. Patriot Act, uh, so customer identification program. We just have to understand and know who we're working with. Dan, can I ask a question? Sure. Okay, so this is the part that's always confused me with these loans, because they're called loans. Uh, it sounds like free money, and I know that's like too good to be true. That's why I've always been like afraid of them, because I run my business. I do have payroll, and it sounds like this would pay my employees? How could that be? What am I missing? So it really is a stimulus program that was just helped to design or that was designed to replace compensation. So, you know, with, especially in this industry, uh, you know, not necessarily having the ability to get out and work as much as you like or to pay your employees because there isn't, you know, as many opportunities. Uh, it is a, a stimulus program that's just meant to keep pumping dollars into the economy. Quite frankly, it's just a way of kind of pushing cash forward. Uh, dollars are being printed for the purpose of, you know, if they're not put in the hands of individuals who may not be working or may have had a reduction in income, that there would be just even more uh, catastrophic effects to the economy and, you know, unemployment, joblessness, homelessness, some, you know, some of those factors that um, if, you know, dollars were to stop coming in, there were real consequences. So um, this is truly a reactionary program. So it, it does kind of sound too good to be true. Um, there are specific guidelines in place again about once you receive the funds, um, you know, if you have applied and you have a number of employees, you can't change the number of employees you have on staff. You can't change the level of compensation they receive beyond a certain level. Um, but in all intents and purposes, this really is, you know, kind of free money um, on the basis that we need these dollars to, to come in and to be spent to keep the economy moving um, at a time of pandemic. That's amazing. I'm I'm kind of like blown away by this. I always thought it was like a scam or something like a line of credit. So I'm, I'll just let you keep talking, but I'm like really excited. And I had no idea that it was a stimulus package. I thought it was something that definitely had to be paid back. Yeah, no, and you're not alone. I think uh, of the majority of conversations I've had with individuals, so uh, I was going to touch on it a little bit later. We work with a, a number of like third-party originator, boutique mortgage uh origination shops, uh, other uh, real estate agent uh, groups. And that is the most common question. Like, how, why is money just being given away? And really, it's uh, just a reactionary measure to just make sure dollars stay in the economy, um, that you know, folks are continuing to pay rent, pay their mortgages, and do all those things we need to just maintain what you know, sense of health we can at this time. It's a great question. Uh, so we'll go on to discuss who's eligible to apply. Um, so sole proprietors, independent contractors, self-employed persons, uh, as well as other types of businesses. So if you're an LLC, if you're incorporated, uh, S-Corp, there's a few different uh, organizational structures, generally speaking, are all uh, encouraged and eligible to apply. So I had mentioned a uh, slide or two back that owner's compensation is limited. Um, or it's capped. So for self-employed individuals, the SBA has limited that owner's compensation figure to the first uh, $100,000 of income you make. 
So uh, what the formula is based on is kind of an annualized uh, salary. So if you made say $100,000 a year, uh, the formula is take two and a half times of whatever that monthly figure is. So you'd say it's capped at $8,333 a month uh, with a max loan amount of 20833 And again, that's just uh, for self-employed individuals. So if you are a sole proprietor, independent contractor, did not have employees or pay payroll taxes through any other mechanism, um, this is the specific loan amount or cap in place. Uh, if you're organized or incorporated and you pay um, you know, FUDA, PUDA, all those different taxes uh, through the IRS, there are uh, different limits in place. Um, and that is really subject to the number of employees you have and, and some other things. So um, really the, the only limiting factor in this is if you're a sole proprietor or self-employed individual, um, it's up to that first 100,000 of your income. So other types of businesses and nonprofit organizations are also eligible, as I'd mentioned, uh, generally speaking, provided that they have less than 500 employees. Um, so this is you know, a program that the SBA created to really try to tackle small business. You know, small business makes up 48% of the jobs in this economy. So um, the idea was if you lost that payroll and you lost those dollars spent, um, it would be very difficult to try to replace them at a later date, uh, just to kind of touch on what we had said a slide back. There are other um, certain eligibility criteria that the SBA has put in place. These are mostly related to federal liabilities. Um, so you know, if you have tax debt, um, not necessarily that uh, you, you're not working on it or you're, there's not a payment plan or something in place, but if you owe you know, taxes from five years ago, um, that might limit your ability to uh, apply for the loan. Um, if there's any type of you know, fraudulent or active bankruptcy cases, those may also impact uh, your eligibility, um, but as you apply with just about any lender, the process is online now. There's questionnaires that are built in um, to any application process to kind of guide you through those questions to let you know where uh, the eligibility may or may not sit. So a uh, little note on how the application process works. Um, so. One thing we always recommend is prior to applying, um, you should gather as much information you have um, with respect to your business um, or your individual taxes. So if you file uh, a Schedule C, which is the uh, schedule that is part of your uh, 1040 tax return for small business, uh, specifically ind independent contractor or sole proprietor, uh, those documents are required and needed. That's actually where the calculation or the owner's compensation formula is derived from. Uh, there's a specific line on that Schedule C document known as uh, line seven. So that, that's the gross income number that I had mentioned. If you are incorporated or LLC or organized another way, um, there are a few documents uh, you'd be asked to provide. And those uh, are related to payroll documentation numbers. So if you run through like a Paylocity or some sort of or QuickBooks or any type of payroll provider, um, there would be information we would look for um, with respect to the past 12 months of the, uh, the payroll you've paid out in addition to revenue numbers. So we also uh, provide a kind of easy checklist that makes it easy depending on what your organizational type is um, to determine what you need to apply. That'll definitely be one of the links I send out at the uh, end of the presentation to the group. But um, for the purposes of this presentation, it's you know, kind of tailored towards the independent contractor, sole proprietor, which is why you see that Schedule C listed there. Uh, we also would require, or any lender would require, a scanned copy of driver's license or state ID, again, just for ID verification purposes, but uh, just great things to have on hand prior to applying just to make the process as smooth as possible. Uh, so you'd complete your application with any SBA-approved lender. Um, so obviously, First Financial Credit Union is one, and we're here uh, talking a little bit about that today, but any SBA-approved lender um, can take these uh, applications. Most of them uh, can be completed online, so making the document upload and the note signing um, as easy as possible. Your lender will then review your application for accuracy and completeness and then forward it on to the SBA for final approval. Um, so while we uh, talk about timelines, we've been seeing the SBA has uh, been turning around approvals in, I don't know, as quick as uh, three to five business days. I'm young. Thanks. Oh, okay, very good. So 
how does the application process work continued? So as we said, the uh, process could take anywhere from three to five business days with the lender to review the documents for completeness and accuracy, uh, then move that on to the SBA through uh, an online portal that the SBA has. Once your loan has been approved or decisioned by the SBA, uh, your lender will reach out to you. They uh, usually do this via email, via DocuSign. Uh, that seems to be the uh, leading way uh, that loan notes are being transmitted and information being shared. Uh, once you complete those documents and then any other uh, institution-specific documentation, so you know if you weren't a customer or you weren't a member there, you may be asked to sign new customer documentation just to help establish that relationship. Uh, but once you do those two things, then the loan funds would be distributed just based on your direction. So uh, if you had a business checking account, you'd want those ACH2. Uh, most uh, lenders are you know, well equipped to be able to do that. One note I did also want to add is um, you may have uh, already applied for and received a PPP loan. Um, it is not a one and done, so to speak, as I had mentioned a, a little bit earlier. This is known as the, this is the third round of PPP loans. You may be eligible for something known as a second draw. So if you've already received one PPP loan, um, there is a process in place to allow you to receive a secondary one um, for the purposes of continuing that employment compensation replacement or those other, other covered expenses. Uh, there's one other uh, criteria that the SBA has put in place here. Uh, the business must be able to show at least a 25% loss in revenue year over year um, from the previous period. So uh, what the SBA looks for is you take a, a comparative quarter. So you could take, say, quarter uh, Q1 2019 versus Q1 2020. If your Q1 2020 revenue is down by 25% or more, um, you would be eligible for a second draw. So that's uh, a revenue calculation they put in place just to ensure that there is some cap or some safeguard and you know, funds going out um, into recipients that are truly in need. So once the loan proceeds have been dis uh, delivered to you, it is up to you to spend them and use them for their intended purpose. As we had mentioned, uh, generally owner's compensation replacement, um, and then also there are some covered expenses such as mortgage, rent, utilities, providing PPE for your employees if you have them. Um, and all of those things go into the forgiveness process uh, because if those funds are spent as intended, uh, you're then eligible to apply for forgiveness. The SBA actually continues to streamline the forgiveness process um, and especially for loans of a certain amount. So loans under $50,000 in this most la uh, latest round are asked to complete a self-certification form um, confirming that you use the funds for the intended process, and that's it. Um, you're not required to provide any additional documentation, um, check, check cancellations, payroll, uh, provider receipts, or anything like that, unless requested by the SBA. So your lender um, generally will not ask you for those for loans under 50000 uh, but your lender will encourage you to make sure that you're uh, segregating those expenses and making sure that you're keeping a good accounting and good tracking of those expenses because at any time the SBA could say, hey, we just want to see the, uh, the proof that this was used for owner's compensation or you know, where did the funds go. Uh, conversely, if the loan is over 50000 um, you may be asked uh, by your lender and you likely will be to submit proof uh, that those funds were used for the intended purpose. Proof for those purposes could be payroll records, canceled checks to pay for mortgage or rent or bank statements. Um, it is up to each individual lender to a certain degree what they want to see, but it's also based on how you transact as a business. Um, not everybody writes checks. Most, you know, Some people use electronic bank transfer. So it really does get down to your specific uh, accounting mechanisms and how you kind of manage your cash flow. Um, but for loans over $50,000, you will generally be asked to submit proof at the time you apply for forgiveness. So the SBA will review the forgiveness request, and if approved, uh, you'll receive notification of that, and then the SBA will send funds to the lender to pay off the loan. Um, so this is the forgiveness piece I referenced. If all is well, if at least 60% of those funds received were used uh, for payroll or for that owner's compensation, uh, that's generally the gate. That's the first thing the SBA is looking for. Uh, once, that uh, once that qualification has been met, um, they work with the lender to pay off that loan, and then in the period of time between you know, when forgiveness is applied for and received, 
you would see uh, or you've received notification from your lender congratulating you, letting you know um, you've been absolved of the, you know, the obligation and the loan would be closed out on their systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, just another note, you know, the SBA, as I had mentioned, is not requiring documented proof for loans under 50,000. Uh, but we strongly suggest if you do apply, regardless of the loan amount, it's always the best practice just to keep the funds uh, segregated and keep a good track. I know given the industry you're all in, that's not uh, something that would be particularly difficult for you. It's something you do pretty much every day. So. Uh, so now that we've talked a little bit about the application and forgiveness uh, piece to the loan, um, it's important that you know that all lenders must receive PPP loan applications by March 31st, 2021. Um, there have also been ongoing discussions in Washington to extend this deadline, but nothing has been confirmed as of yet. Um, the SBA has remained steadfast in encouraging lenders and applicants. Um, if you do choose to apply, if you think it's right for you, please make sure you kind of march toward that March 31st deadline, um, although it is likely that it could extend out into May. Um, is kind of the, is the next uh, deadline date we're hearing. So how can you apply? Um, you can, one, go to our website, firstfcu.org slash PPP. Um, we have a website that uh, makes it really easy to um, not only understand the process, it lists the, or provides the checklist I had mentioned a few slides back um, and gives you an easy way just to go to our online loan application portal. Um, our loan application process is done entirely online. It allows you to upload the documents um, in real time, transmit those back and forth to us securely. Um, and then once your loan is approved, uh, we would send you a DocuSign with information about the loan so that uh, you don't have to you know, print anything out, make it to a branch or do anything like that. It's entirely online. Dan, uh, I have another quick question. Sure. Sorry to interrupt. I know you said yeah, it was interactive. So um, I'm just brainstorming. My mind is like firing on all cylinders. I'm excited. Um, is there a, a seasoning period for how long you've had to have had staff? Like, for example, I just officially hired mine this month and I do have like a budget and a P&L and I'll have documentation that they're being paid, you know, with this. How does that work? So that's a great question. So you have to have been in business prior to um, February 15th of 2020 um, to be eligible to apply for the program. But if you were operating as your own like, independent contractor at that time and then have uh, expanded out, um, yes. you are eligible to apply. So what we would use is there is a kind of um, modified payroll calculation formula we could use based on um, what type of uh, payroll data you have, and then revenue numbers up until this point. So essentially, if you'd say you started this two months ago, um, we could take that two month period and use that to come up with a, a per diem of sorts uh, to get you to that new calculation. Okay, and then also second follow up question, as far as my own owner's compensation, last year, I was like a sole proprietor, I did not have an S corp or anything like that. And I just basically, you know, just paid my taxes and used the money as my own salary or whatever, whatever was left over. This year I have an S corp and I have not paid myself a salary this year. I've been working my other job and paying myself from there. Are they going to use like last year? Can they, is the S corp going to make this a whole different entity or? Yes. Yeah, so that's a good question. So S corps um, do they're a little bit more of a complicated tax structure just based on the way you can choose to uh, incent or pay yourself as an owner. The, uh, without having the documents in front of me, I think the uh, quickest answer I could give you is that it would likely be that you would look to apply as a sole proprietor using that information from the sole proprietor return. Um, because if you are a S Corp, and you don't intend to provide yourself like a K-1 or take a, a business distribution and pay taxes on it, those types of structures are generally ineligible for the program. So um, if you're looking to take a distribution as an owner of a business, but then not um, pay the, the food tax and the other you know, taxes that uh, go through that process, that is one of the limiting factors, but it is a little bit more of a specialized situation. Um, with that, we generally say, uh, let's sit down with the documents that you have, looking at your 2019, your 2020, um, and make a determination based on which would be the best way to apply. 
Okay, perfect. I'll touch base with you after. Excellent, great questions. Uh -huh. So a few other notes, as I mentioned, you do not have to be a current member uh, or customer of First Financial Credit Union. If you chose to apply with us, the link is up on our website. Um, if you did apply, we would walk you through that process of becoming a member. Um, in a slide or two, I'm just gonna share a little bit about a credit union if you're not familiar and the, the differences between maybe a traditional bank. Um, but if you choose not to apply with us, the SBA also has a list of SBA approved lenders on their website. So sba.gov um, definitely is gonna be one of the links I send along. Uh, with uh, today's presentation and any of the other documentation I had referenced. Um, more than welcome, obviously, to check out that list and apply from any of the lenders there. So I saved this for the end. I just wanted to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about uh, who First Financial Credit Union is. So obviously, you've been listening to me yammer on for about uh, the better part of a half an hour. So First Financial Credit Union uh, was founded in 1936. We were the Teletype Employees Federal Credit Union. Um, so a division of AT&T ultimately ending up uh, as AT&T, then splitting into Lucent Technologies and several other subsidiary organizations. Um, as part of that transition, First Financial uh, was born into what's known as a community credit union. So rather than just serving the employees of one specific organization, we decided to uh, branch out in 2000 and serve the greater Chicagoland community at large. Uh, today, we have about 12,000 members, as I mentioned, in the greater Chicagoland area, mostly northern Chicago. Um, we are up to about $110 million in assets, and that's up from $74 million in 2019. Uh, just some context to share our growth and you know, the trajectory we're looking at. We're relatively, uh, we like to call ourselves an old startup. So we've been around for a long time, uh, mm -hmm. but we've kind of retooled over the past uh, four or five years and are really looking to uh, expand out, you know, not only uh, the level of service we have, but the individuals and businesses throughout the Chicago land that we do service. Uh, we are a full service financial institution. So as I mentioned, traditional banking products and services, your high rate checking accounts, savings accounts, things of that nature. Um, but it's important and I really like to talk about this with anybody I have the opportunity to. There's a really key difference between a bank that you may be used to um, and a credit union. So credit unions are entirely member owned. So the only uh, individuals and businesses that we're responsible uh, to answer to, aside from our regulators, no escaping regulators, um, are our members. So the people who bank with us. If you have an account every year, you have the ability to vote on our board of directors. You get the ability to vote on certain decisions that impact the business. Um, and we, for lack of a better term, don't reach out to anybody else or consult any other uh, outside uh, shareholders in that process. It's important to us that uh, the decisions we make as an organization are controlled by our members. They understand there's full transparency. A uh, couple other notes, I think specifically as it's related to your all's industry. Uh, we say this with a, a good and bad way. We're Illinois' smallest Freddie Mac direct seller servicer. So uh, we went out and went straight to Freddie Mac about 2016, um, and it's about a 70 million organization and said, hey, we want to go directly to you. We want to cut out all the third party origination cost, um, all the servicing costs. I mean, we want to be able to provide our members with the most low qual uh, low, excuse me, low rate, high quality loans possible. Um, to that end in 2020, you know, telling, uh, you know, to tell you all how the rate environment went, we originated and serviced uh, up to about 500 million in residential mortgages. Thank you, Rinky. Thank you, Rinky. So I am going to, uh, one, give some CYA. There's always CYA in the presentation. Uh, neither I or First Financial Credit Union are qualified legal or tax advisors. So, you know, this is not intended to be tax or legal advice. Uh, what we will do is use the program guidelines that the SBA has set out, do our best to um, communicate those to you so that you're applying for a loan that, you know, not only gives you the highest chance for forgiveness, uh, but is something that helps, you know, replace that owner's compensation. Anything we do say, obviously, uh, we always recommend that you verify with any, you know, tax advisors or uh, legal counselors you may have, um, just because that's not our field of expertise. While we, you know, consult with our own attorneys and have CPAs on staff, uh, we're not in the business of providing this type of advice. Uh, so I do want to definitely mention that. I'm going to open it for questions now, and I know there are a few in the chat, so thank you for your patience. I'm going to go through. So I think one of the questions was about uh, S Corp. So I probably touched on that a little bit. Uh, I will 
connect, I think, with you specifically, Joanna, on that, because the requirements for S-Corp um, are just different based on how you choose to take distributions from the organization. Um, some S-Corps choose to be taxed as a single member LLC or as a sole proprietor. Others choose to be taxed um, by not taking um, distributions or having any type of pass-through income. So uh, the scenario is, I don't want to say case by case, but it really depends on what, uh, how you t uh, file taxes and if you pay payroll taxes on those dollars. So then the next question. So there is no uh, loan origination cost. So it, full disclosure, um, any SBA lender receives a fee from the SBA directly as part of the process for uh, taking the loan application and having a loan approval, but it's not something that you actually bear the cost of or the cost passed on to you. I'm not, I'm not the listing agent. That's the instructions that So that looks like uh, the majority of the questions I had received in the chat. Um, feel free to open it up to any questions you may have, uh, either about the application process, about First Financial or myself. I hate to take up more time with like a very similar question, but I'm still trying to grasp like the S Corp thing. And I, I know that you've explained it a couple of times, but like specific situation, like if I was on my own last year as just an individual, I did not have like an expense line for any staff at all. And then I incorporated, I, I basically made January like a fresh start. S Corp, you know, QuickBooks, a staff, I like completely re reorganized my business. I just am curious, like how they're going to look at my application. If they use me from last year, it's just going to be like, I mean, I, I did actually track all of my expenses because I had to file taxes, but are, are those the only things they're going to let me use it towards? So if, um, if you're, if you're looking, I guess at 2019 or uh, yeah, excuse me, 2019 where you had filed as a sole proprietor, um, what they would look at is specifically on that tax or in your tax return, you file the document known as a Schedule C. Um, that's where I'd reference that line gross income. That would be the line they use for the basis of owner's compensation. For the S Corp, it would depend on. So, do you, um, I know you said you payrolled, are, would your employees be 1099 or do you full payroll them and pay for the 1099? Uh, Okay, so then in that case, if it's a 1099 um, and you choose not to uh, draw distributions from the business or pay taxes, in that case, you wouldn't be eligible to apply um, for a loan based on that employee number. But if I applied as myself, could so, I then use that to pay them as a 1099? So you could, if you chose to take the uh, sole proprietor route and you took the funds, you would then be the sole owner and you could distribute them to yourself. Um, if you chose to remit those funds as part of like a compensation package, um, it would not be, and I, this is where it kind of gets into the tax liability thing and I, I uh -huh. kind of tread lightly, um, deductibility would not be something generally speaking that you could utilize those funds for. Um, so you could choose to, for lack of a better word, give that to your employees out of the goodness of your own heart um, as compensation replacement but for the purposes of like payroll calculation or any deductibility on the 1099, those funds would generally not be uh, permissible. So I could pay myself since I paid myself last year, but are they going to then look at my S Corp and be like, wait a minute, she's running this whole business and now she's paying herself as like a sole proprietor. What's going on here? No, so you have the ability to file either using a 2019 or 20 filed, excuse me, 2020 filed tax return. Uh, so just based on the organizational status changing from one year to the next, you're within the uh, program guidelines. We've actually had uh, a number of other individuals in a very similar boat who had a successful year and said, hey, I really need to branch out and I need to, um, I need to bring in some more help. Uh, but kind of fell into that same uh, scenario. So they have um, successfully applied under the 2019 as a sole proprietor, received those funds and did so um, on uh, not only just, you know, us assisting them, but with the guidance of their tax counselor. Okay. 
I think I'm going to have to have a meeting with you after so I don't take everyone's time, but I, I definitely like I'm interested and I just want to make sure that if I use it, I'm using it correctly. Yeah, absolutely. That's the biggest piece. Um, you, we want to make sure that before you, you know, take any application or receive any funds that forgiveness, the likelihood of it is as high as it possibly can be. Yeah. And so one thing I will do is you'll have my direct contact information as I send out this uh, presentation. Please feel free to reach out to me anytime. Um, I always caution email is usually best. Uh, I spend most days on calls such as this, but uh, always happy to connect outside of business hours also just based on anybody's availability. So you'll have my uh, contact information here. Does anyone else have any questions? Dan, this was amazing. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. I hope it was helpful. I know there's uh, some things just based on the nature that we, you know, I, I'm not a tax expert, so I don't want to make it sound like I don't know what I'm talking about. But at the same time, we, I can't, uh, we don't want to caution you to do one thing or the other, um, unless you really, you know, speak to somebody who, who does your taxes and we have a good understanding. So um, mm -hmm. hopefully it didn't sound like elusive or anything, but uh, just given the, the CYA nature. Uh, but yeah, I really hope it was helpful. I do appreciate everyone's time. Thank you, Dan.